Kia ora everyone, welcome to this Good Fellow Unit webinar on brain tumours, trigeminal neuralgia and facial pain. I'm Dr Helen Fulcher, I'm a GP and presenting our session tonight is Mr Patrick Schrader. Patrick is a neurosurgeon at Auckland City Hospital and in private at Auckland Brain and Spine Surgery at Ascot Hospital. He is also the inaugural academic neurosurgeon at the University of Auckland. Welcome Patrick. Thank you very much and uh, welcome to everyone to the webinar tonight. Tonight's webinar is kindly supported by Muthi Ascot. Thank you for coming, Patrick. I'll hand over to you. Thank you. And I'm very happy to answer uh, questions about cases, um, uh, if you have uh, cases or patients that you're thinking of. Um, if it, as long as it's not too complex, we kind of spend the whole lot of webinar on a, a single patient. Um, but we can always talk further. And I didn't uh, pass on my email address on this web, uh, on this slide, but um, Helen can pass that on. You're welcome to email uh, uh, if you have any questions about specific patients. So. In terms of, uh, I switched it around actually, we were going to start with brain tumours and then facial pain. I just uh, thought we'll do facial pain first and then brain tumours. And we'll talk about some likely scenarios of what one might see. But um, in terms of facial pain and trigeminal neuralgia, if you've heard me speak before about it, I'm obviously very passionate about the topic. It, probably in terms of prevalence and incidence, there ought to be about 200 new patients per year in Auckland. Uh, there probably aren't quite that many, but in other words, it's probably a little bit underdiagnosed they usually have dramatic presentations. And the question is really, can anything be done? And how do you differentiate the one that's very treatable, although others are treatable as well, which is trigeminal neuralgia? So I think the things to discuss is, we'll briefly talk about trigeminal neuralgia. That's the most important one, maybe some scenarios surrounding it and atypical um, facial pain. And what can actually be done? Um, how can we address the patient concerns in the clinic? Are there any options? And what are those options? Um, and also things like, oh, you know, if somebody found something on Google, is this actually available? Is it available here in New Zealand? And what can we do in terms of medication or um, a referral on? Uh, so the first question is, um, is it easy to diagnose? Very easy to diagnose. It's simply pain in the face. I mean, that sounds ob obvious, but that's what it is. Facial pain is pain in usually one side of the face. So it's trigeminal pain of some sort, whether it be trigeminal neuralgic pain, trigeminal neuropathic pain, or an atypical version thereof. And in a sense, anyone can make the diagnosis. It probably is half the time it's you, um, general practitioners, uh, well, maybe 60% general practitioners, 40% of the time it's dentists uh, who make the diagnosis when there's basically facial pain in either the upper jaw uh, or the lower jaw, and it may mimic tooth pain. In terms of trigeminal neuropathy specifically, Usually the cause is a tiny blood vessel around the nerve at the level of the brain stem. We'll talk about that in a little bit and I'll show you a slide of that. There are unusual causes, which we don't need to get into too much detail. We'll check for them. It's the kind of thing that um, uh, uh, you know, neurosurgeons will always do. I always, certainly always do an MRI to double check the unusual causes, which could be a tumor or could be MS, and make sure we have a look at the most common cause. Um, what are we supposed to talk about? Well, that there are investigations for it. A, a dedicated brain MRI for trigeminal neuralgia or for facial pain is worthwhile to exclude the unusual and maybe to look for the usual. The next thought would be, well, if it's pain, shouldn't treatment be simple? Can't we just give pain relief? And we can, and there's very effective pain relief. If we start in your practice, you know, the diagnosis in the history, the patient has facial pain. Um, Usually one side, it can occasionally be bilateral, but it's usually one side and it's quite obvious uh, because it's often a dramatic and excruciating type of agonizing presentation. Um, I can save you time on the examination in the sense that it's usually normal. Of course, you might want to check uh, for facial numbness, uh, but basically the examination is usually normal. If it's not normal, it's usually an unusual cause rather than the typical cause of trigeminal neuralgia. If, of course, it's not normal, chances are you may want to refer on or get some further scans anyway. So if the patient has pain, why don't we try some pain relief? So the traditional diagnostic tool to try would be carbamazepine. Uh, I'm sure you all know it. It's an anti-epileptic. It can be very useful for trigeminal neuralgia. Um, we often think of it as diagnostic, although it isn't always, meaning that patients should respond. They may respond quite dramatically within a few days. It might take a bit longer for the levels to build up. You can start on something like 200 milligram twice a day, and you can up titrate. So 200 milligram twice a day is a, is a um, small dose. That's how I would start someone usually. And often it's quite a dramatic effect and the pain goes. And that's great. So you've done them uh, obviously a huge favor by doing that. 
The question now is, will it last? And I guess the, the discussion is about quality of life. So the pain will usually become medication refractory, meaning that eventually it'll break through. We then have options to either increase the dose or to add a second medication. We can add something like gabapentin or pregabalin. But usually increasing the dose is a good start. So if we increase the dose, we usually buy ourselves also some more side effects. And then it's a matter of titrating between is the pain controlled and are the side effects acceptable or satisfactory. So usually what happens eventually is either the pain breaks through all levels of pain relief and or the side effects are just unacceptable and they may want to think, well, what about something else? Um, that's where I usually have a discussion, ideally early, to simply give them all the various options that we'll talk about in a second, um, simply as options. One never has to have any kind of surgery for this or for most other things. It's simply an option and they can choose whenever the pain is severe enough or the side effects are just ruining life. And the main side effects of carbamazepine would be fatigue, drowsiness. Um, the, uh, people can't function as well. Um, I would usually recommend to refer reasonably early, simply for a discussion. Uh, ultimately, it's a surgical condition, so it's nice. Uh, uh, I usually portray to patients, I'm on standby. They may uh, want something done in a month or in a year or 10 years, uh, depending on how they go with medication. And some people are absolutely fine with carbamazepine for years. Um, there is a very famous neurosurgeon, uh, um, uh, Tim Burchell, who does a lot of uh, trigeminal neurology surgery in Oregon in the US. His phrase, uh, he's often said is, usually in his experience, patients eventually will need surgery. And he sort of says, says the word need, uh, may want to like, uh, may want to uh, approach surgery uh, simply because uh, the quality of life is not ideal with regards to either the pain or the side effects. Does that make sense so far? It's hard, I can't gauge your reaction, obviously, so hopefully, hopefully that all um, is um, reasonably uh, logical. Yeah, I guess sure. the other thing to mention is, um, uh, when it comes to most neurosurgery, actually, it isn't necessarily complex at all. It's rather a series of sort of logical steps of how to think about it. And when I think about treatment of trigeminal neuralgia, I just break it down into, well, you can either do nothing because this isn't life-threatening, or we can do something. And then of the something, they each have advantages and disadvantages. So most of the time, it's a vascular loop, or vascular compression or contact at the level of the brainstem. In other words, one can think of it quite simply. You have a trigeminal nerve. It's a normal nerve. You should have it. You have a blood vessel, it's a normal blood vessel, you should have it, but they ought not to be touching or one should not be compressing the other. It is probably quite, you know, a lot more complex in terms of the actual mechanism and etiology of pain generation, but that's a very simplistic way to portray it. We know that it's more complex because some people have asymptomatic neurovascular contact. However, should we say it like this, if somebody has facial pain, uh, or trigeminal neuralgic pain, and there's a blood vessel compressing the nerve, the two are likely related. Some of the time there might be other things around the nerve, such as, for example, a tumor. The other thing to think of, uh, or that we, I certainly think of, and I double checked for in, on an MRI, is uh, the possibility of MS, multiple sclerosis. Um, again, those are less common. In terms of options, well, you can do nothing. Uh, the risk there is really the risk of lack of pain relief. Uh, so this used to be called the suicide disease, so it is definitely an agonizing kind of pain, and I guess in one sense it can be life-threatening, but doing nothing is an option if the patient can tolerate it. Doing something, each sort of uh, you know, aspect of doing something has advantages and disadvantages. Usually I would start with a, uh, uh, an MRI to investigate the cause. Uh, never mind the rest of the information on the slide, basically we look for a blood vessel. It used to be said it's probably about a 50-50 hit rate in terms of whether we find one or not, but the specificity and sensitivity of MRI is better and better and better these days. However, it's still not perfect, meaning if we don't find uh, neurovascular contact, uh, yet the patient has very typical trigeminal neuralgia type 1 symptoms, uh, it may still be worth considering doing something surgically. This would be an image of doing something surgically. So this is actually endoscopic rather than microscopic, which is how I do uh, multi, uh, sorry, microvascular decompression. Um, whilst we're looking at this beautiful picture, I'll just explain what that is. So basically there is a blood vessel around the nerve. The idea would be to separate the blood vessel from the nerve and put a little bit of padding in there, usually felt. That's all there is to it. So the theory of it is so simplistic. Uh, in, Obviously, it's uh, still surgery to the brain, which means it has risks. It's actually one of the most beautiful operations. I did one of these today. It's a, a beautiful operation for many reasons. It's beautiful anatomy, but also because it can be so effective. Uh, nothing's ever universally effective, 
but it can be dramatically effective. People may even wake up pain free. Now, obviously, one can't guarantee it. So we can have a look, look at the literature to see how successful actually is it. Lots of different studies, usually they compare different modalities, so either microvascular decompression or maybe a gamma-knife, which we, by the way, don't have in New Zealand uh, for trigeminal neuralgia. But a microvascular decompression, eight to nine out of 10 people, so between 80 and 90% success rate. Greater than five years, 84%. There's been up to 20 year follow-up, maybe about 80%. So it does have nice longevity of pain relief. So it's certainly, if there is neurovascular contact, it would be the preferred method of treatment usually. However, it's just one option, so I'll quickly mention the other options, although we, um, I'm very happy to, at any point, pause and discuss a patient scenario. By the way, it's not just for younger patients, um, it's just as uh, safe, in a sense, in older patients and just as efficacious. So I would certainly be happy to treat a patient in their 70s or even 80s, obviously depending on their overall health status. If it's not Typical facial pain, it might be type 2 trigeminal neuralgia, which is another subtype, or there's no blood vessel. Can we still do something for the nerve? And we can still, if we get there and we don't see a blood vessel, we can do something called an internal neurolysis, where the outcomes aren't quite as good, but one can still achieve something, usually coupled with numbness, actually, the face uh, or half the face would go numb. If that doesn't work as a backup option, or if somebody doesn't can't really tolerate an anesthetic, or they simply don't want a larger procedure. This is about a two hour operation under an anesthetic and the patient would be in hospital for about four to five nights, usually. There are percutaneous options, meaning just a needle through the cheek to get to the foramen ovale, which is in the base of the skull. And these are just some pictures from some uh, publications as to we put a needle in to the base of the skull. Um, I, I, on the right, you can see there is CT in the proper CT, so I usually do a spin at the time. We get a needle into the right spot and we inflate a balloon. You could do three things. You can either burn the nerve, the frequency, you can add chemicals such as glycerol or balloon. I've done all three in my various um, uh, places of training overseas, but um, uh, I certainly prefer balloon compression. In a sense, we're basically doing something to artificially numb or damage the nerve to stop it from conducting pain. So it doesn't have as great longevity, a few years, um, and it will certainly or almost certainly be coupled by numbness. Percutaneous options, are, look, I mentioned them as options. It is usually better, it's a, it's a good option when the MVD has failed, the microvascular decompression hasn't worked, um, and it has fair to good efficacy, and it probably has slightly less risk um, in the sense that it's a smaller procedure. What's sometimes hard is, you know, what can be confusing if it's not quite trigeminalgia, you know, if you look at the descriptions of lancinating, type one pain, shooting, electric shock-like pain, but, uh, but it's not that, it's burning, it's constant, it's hard to differentiate between, you know, is it dental in origin? Is it neuropathic? Could it be post-herpetic pain? If it's simply bad facial pain, one can still think about doing something to the nerve. But if we think of it on a global level, most of these somethings are less, uh, uh, slightly less, um, uh, uh, effective than for typical trigeminal neuralgia, but they can still be effective. So there are still some options, especially if somebody's been suffering in agony for a long time. Again, all the non-operative options. One can still consider microvascular compression or internal neurolysis or the percutaneous methods. And then this is very much fine print. I'll skip over these slides. There are some backup options which you know, we, could, we could talk about for a long time because you know uh, I'm obviously fascinated by all the pain uh, pathways in the brain. But there are some backup options such as sectioning the nerve or sectioning parts of the um, uh, pain relay centers, the nucleus caudalis, the uh, sensory part of the thalamus, the cingulum bundle. All of these are backup options which we hardly ever have to use. Um, and there's, uh, there's uh, evidence and literature there to support it for, for example, post-herpetic neuralgia. There are also options for neuromodulation. And again, this is very fine print. Uh, it's very exciting, but most people don't need this. That would be for facial pain, either deep brain stimulation or motor cortex stimulation. These are, in a sense, implantable pacemakers for the brain, either deep inside the brain, in the thalamus or in the cingulate, or over the motor cortex. Fine print, so I'll skip over it now. And to complete the picture, one can actually fire radiation at the nerve at the nerve root entry zone. Typically, it's described with gamma knife, which we don't have in New Zealand. So I thought I'd bring that up, but um, we don't have it. So um, I won't dwell on it for too long. Um, if people, if your patients have heard about it, let's say, for example, they look this up on Google or this focused ultrasound or gamma knife, and they would like to talk about it, I'm certainly very happy to speak with them. And there are places around the world where they can go where they have good um, 
uh, good provision of those services. This is simply to illustrate that craniofacial pain is sometimes hard to differentiate the various syndromes. There are so many different craniofacial pain syndromes. If it's hard for you to think about what, which one is it, simply neurologic, trigeminal neurologic, uh, you know, atypical migraine, hemicrania continue, uh, don't beat yourself up too much. It's sometimes simply hard, and it's a process of elimination, sometimes based on drug therapy, based on uh, MRIs uh, and, and other investigations. So it is quite complex. So about this part of the um, webinar, what would be the recommendations? I think, uh, needless to say, it's, I guess to appreciate that facial pain can be very, very severe. Medication may well become limited. And uh, I think, I always think it's worth a surgical discussion to simply look at the options and to investigate the cause and then to discuss treatment options, which may not be needed for quite some time to come, but people know or feel safe that there's a, there are options out there to treat in the future. And for the first half, Helen, how would you like to do this? Should we discuss this topic a little bit more? Yes, we've had a few questions come through, Patrick. So first of all, is, is there a typical patient profile for someone getting the trigeminal neuralgia pain, age, sex, size? Um, not really. Time? There are some, there are some uh, sort of epidemiological studies out there. It basically actually can affect anyone. Um, so it could be, you know, a young 32-year-old professional who simply has very severe pain. It could be the person who's had pain for five years and never really talked to anyone about it. Um, there isn't a typical patient profile. What would be a typical story that I would see, which wouldn't be necessarily the same that you would see, would be that people have had pain, they've gone to the dentist, they've gone to another dentist, they may have gone to a doctor, they might have read things online, they've tried all sorts of medication, and then eventually we, we discuss what this could be. So they do try lots of different, um, or present to lots of different health uh, care practitioners. Um, I guess one can save them, uh, you know, uh, many trips to many different people um, by simply, I guess, in a sense, picking it up. So the patient that would present to you, in a sense, could be anyone, um, male and female, of any age, actually, although typically not in adoles uh, adolescence or childhood, but even young adulthood. Um, and it's usually quite a striking, dramatic presentation where they come in agony. And then in the back of your mind, you can have, okay, could this be a tumor? Could this be a mess? But very likely it's simply uh, trigeminal neuralgia if it has those typical features. Does that sort of help answer it? Yeah, I think that's that's perfect. Now, and there's a couple of questions around the different types. So type one and type two, you've di differentiated uh, between vascular and non-vascular. Uh, yeah, that's probably not quite fair of me to um, differentiate so simply in, uh, with the vascular um, contact component. Type 1 and type 2 is a new classification. Basically, previously there was typical trigeminalgia, the lancinating type of pain, and atypical facial pain, everything else. Now there's the International Headache, class, um, Headache Society classification. There's a bunch of classification systems, including type 1 and type 2. Type 1 being the classic, type 2 being a more constant, sometimes dull, sometimes more of a burning pain, so it doesn't have the classic shooting features. That doesn't mean it doesn't necessarily have a blood uh, vessel uh, neurovascular contact cause. I should have not mentioned that actually so strictly. Um, but it, uh, it, how should I phrase it? It may well have that cause as well, but it's usually a, a presentation where it's simply constant burning pain. That it would be a clinical differentiation. I hope I didn't get that confused um, or get people confused, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, and um, a further question about the natural history of trigeminal neuralgia, how many patients resolve spontaneously and over how long? Yes, that's a great question. I must say, I'm, to be honest, I don't know. Uh, I've certainly seen that. I've certainly heard about it. Um, people have severe pain and then simply spontaneously stops without any medication. In hindsight, you wonder what it was a trigeminal neuralgia. I don't see too many of them uh, because I see the ones that come back when, uh, when it hasn't resolved. Um, you may see many more where they have facial pain and you might consider a bit of medication, may not, they might call back next week and say, well, look, actually the pain's gone. In hindsight, we may not know what the cause was or whether it was trigeminal neuralgia. Um, I typically don't see it so often. I have had it occasionally, uh, and it's obviously pleasing to note when it does um, resolve. Um, I don't think it happens that often though. And on to the medication, what is the role of tricyclics in the use of facial pain? Um, I, I might be, uh, so which ones are you thinking of? Oh, I haven't had, they, no one suggested they've talked about just general tricyclic antidepressants. Um, I guess less of a role really, um, that maybe, I guess it's in a sense more, 
uh, come in. Yeah, it, it's probably more indicated for neuropathic pain. Well, not probably, but that's what it's used for. When it comes to all um, neuropathic pain medications, there's so many different options, um, and there's so many different uh, uh, studies out there, um, but they're all unique to different neuropathic pain syndromes. Trigeminal neuralgia is not really a neuropathic pain syndrome, so I can answer it. Uh, quite simply by saying, I think there's a limited role for that. It, there's a there's more of a striking role for carbamazepine, um, and the other one that's been studied for trigeminalgia would be um, gabapentin. Uh, there is another one that isn't available, oxycarbazine, I think it's called, um, isn't available here um, uh, in New Zealand. But I would say carbamazepine, gabapentin, one could try pregabalin, anything else. And we're talking probably more about neuropathic pain syndromes, which it may be very worthwhile treating that but it probably it isn't indicative of a neuralgia um, per se. It okay. still might respond to some of those other treatments I haven't said that. Yeah. I hope I didn't make that too convoluted. No, that's good. There's been a, a few other comments around um, the use of gabapentin. So, you know, if, if someone does develop a reaction or bad side effects with carbamazepine, would you trial gabapentin as the next step or is there a better alternative? And you mentioned also carbamazepine, which I, I didn't yeah. realize wasn't available in New Zealand, so. Yeah, I don't think it is. So I would, you, I can tell you what I would do. And uh, you know, I'm not a world expert. I'm simply a very enthusiastic about treating it. Obviously, I'm very passionate about treating trigeminalgia. Um, I would start with carbamazepine. If they have a reaction, then I would actually go back to the drawing board and say, okay, well, we can, we can do another one. So I usually would do gabapentin um, to see if they can tolerate that. I find personally that the side effects might be um, a little bit more pronounced for gabapentin. Uh, I don't know what people's experiences between carbamazepine and gabapentin. Um, and then to try along the gabapentin path until or the pain becomes refractory or the side effects become unmanageable. Some people say, look, I've tried one medication. I don't really want to bother trying others. You know, let's think about um, surgery. That may be too early, but uh, I basically just, you know, restart all of the discussion thing. You know, you've still got all these options. Um, so as to the question about gabapentin, yes, it's worthwhile trying. No, what I would never focus on trying any of these medications because ultimately if they work, that's brilliant. I can just tell you in my experience what doesn't seem to work so well and what works better, that's all. But I don't mind you trying five or six. Um, uh, you know, obviously, you're a specialist. Um, uh, um, uh, it's up to you. Sorry, Patrick, another question was about lamotrigine in particular. I haven't found it very useful. Um, I have seen patients where it has been useful. Um, uh, or it has partially controlled the pain. Um, and I guess in a, in a sense, remember, I do see the subset of those patients when um, things don't work as well. So I do see them when um, they've already tried a few medications and some of them are, have been trying lamotrigine and it hasn't been successful. If there is someone out there that's tried lamotrigine where it's been beautifully successful, I may not know about it. I have seen a couple of those, but I may not know about the entire number of those scenarios. And with the great success rate with the surgery, um, why aren't we referring patients earlier rather than trialing the um, patient? Oh, look, uh, uh, two things. Um, you know, yes, it can be great success rate. One never wants to over talk anything, obviously, in surgery. Um, uh, there are, uh, it, it may not work. And also, I should, I should stress also that there are risks to surgery. So any risk of um, uh, surgery to the brain, you know, the risk of a stroke or neurological deficit. So there are all those risks to, to discuss as well. So I wouldn't want to sort of say surgery is, um, uh, you know, always a success without risk. I wouldn't want to binarize it like that. However, um, I definitely think surgery can be a very good option. And probably in terms of why it's, um, uh, it hasn't been referred as much, maybe it, it's because it's been a little bit under-recognized. I mean, um, at Auckland Med School, because you know I'm at, I'm at the med school doing lecturing. Um, at Auckland Med School, in six years of medical school, I think you get four hours of neurosurgery. So it's just hard to fit it all in. It used to be two hours. And in 2015, when I came back, we made it four hours, so we doubled it. But it's just not not that much. So it's no one's fault. I don't think people get exposed to neurosurgery, and so they may not have known that um, this entity exists. Although I'm sure many, I'm sure you've all seen it, um, and that there are treatments, but. Let me, I guess, stress by saying that these treatments aren't 100% uh, successful necessarily. So it can be. It's a matter of careful counselling with the patient. Uh, there are certainly options, but um, uh, it's about managing and setting expectations, especially when it comes to treating pain. Certainly, we've all you may have seen some of the anecdotes of when people are truly in agony and then they're pain-free. That can certainly happen, but some people actually uh, don't benefit, and then we have to you know, think about other things and get the pain clinic. Of potential. 
sorry, Patrick, is the surgery available in both public and private in New Zealand? Yes. Both. Yeah. Um, I don't know if any people are listening from outside of Auckland, but most neurosurgical centres in, uh, in New Zealand would uh, uh, probably be able to offer, um, uh, for example, a microvascular decompression, I believe. Yeah. And are there um, associated conditions with trigeminal neuralgia, um, things like migraine or anxiety or anything else? Um, I wouldn't be able to give you an academic answer on that in terms of any studies or uh, true links. Uh, certainly many people develop uh, with, with chronic pain comes a lot of other conditions, uh, uh, potentially or development of conditions. So certainly there are enough studies to show that chronic pain or basically persistent pain of a neurologic type or a neuropathic type can in a sense, for lack of a better description, rewire the brain or brain pathways. And with it can come uh, dysfunction of mood, for example, depression or anxiety, that can come along with it. Um, what was the other one you mentioned apart from anxiety? Uh, migraines. Migraines. Um, I can't give you an academic answer on that. Sometimes it's hard to differentiate whether it is one or the other, although with classic trigeminal neuralgia, it's usually not, doesn't have features of migraine and people don't describe an aura typically either. That's more the domain of some uh, a headache uh, a neurologist in a sense. I, I wouldn't want to portray myself with uh, great expertise there. And actually, that brings uh, to one other point um, that's been brought up, Patrick, is, is that when we refer patients in, they often get referred through to neuro neurology rather than neurosurgery. Do, yeah. Should we be referring to you directly? Um, no, it's fine either way, because neurologists would often see the patient and they would optimise the medication. You know, maybe try some other medication. Um, maybe a neurologists are very obviously very good diagnosticians in terms of uh, determining whether this is trigeminal neuralgia, whether this is type 1, type 2, whether this is another kind of craniofacial pain or headache syndrome. So there's certainly, uh, you know, that, that, that would be an appropriate pathway. And often the neuro uh, neurology colleagues, they would refer um, to us then afterwards and say, well, look, you know, um, Think we've maxed out on the medication or uh, the patient doesn't really want to take too much medication they would like to discuss options um, but you're welcome to refer directly to neurosurgery as well uh, yeah for, for that discussion either way is fine i'm okay. not sure who has a longer wait list <laughs> <laughs> i think we should move on to the to the next topic um in the interest of time we can come back to that yeah. if we have time yeah uh all right so we'll move on to a little bit about cancer, brain tumours and scenarios um, uh, in your clinics uh, because one always, one I guess one assumes that brain tumours, they're not that common in, the, uh, in everyday sort of practice, but they can be or the consequences of brain tumours can be. And again, neurosurgery isn't necessarily complex, but rather a series of logical steps. Um, in, in this scenario, we'll talk about primary and secondary. Secondary being metastatic spread. We can, we'll primarily talk about the brain, but also the spine and primary being from within the brain. I tried to sort of figure out some numbers based on prevalence and incidence for Auckland. I'm sorry for those outside of Auckland, but probably in terms of meningiomas, there ought to be about 100 new patients every year. This is diagnosis, not necessarily surgery. Glioma is about 100. Brain metastases, 200 or maybe more than 200. Um, so there certainly are enough that often present either to the emergency department directly or to the uh, GP clinic with a variety of symptoms which I wanted to discuss because it can be um, uh, quite variable how patients present. In terms of just discussing the two primary types, we've, you've all seen these types and you've all had lots of letters, you know, meningioma, we're doing the follow-up, you know, glioma, oh, we need radiotherapy. But just to break it down simply, so meningiomas, they're basically from the meninges, from the surface lining of the brain. And primarily it's all about location. So all the descriptions of a meningioma are, you know, where they are, the convexity, uh, supracellar, cerebellar pontine angle, foramen magnum, everything, all the descripting, uh, the describing words of a meningioma um, it would be to describe where they are, because that determines uh, what they can cause and also how difficult it is potentially to take out and also whether they may or may not need radiotherapy. So meningioma, meningiomas, all about location. Gliomas, it's almost less consequential where they are, but rather it's all about what's their intrinsic nature, which is which grade are they, their character, and that is, in a sense, how aggressive they are. We number it from one to four, four being bad. Four would be a glioblastoma, and that is a malignant, aggressive brain tumor that is unfortunately not beatable in a sense. It does keep on recurring, recurring, and it's um, uh, a malignant scenario. And it almost doesn't matter where it is, but rather what it is. Um, I think it's nice to sort of think of them as two separate entities like that. I hope that helps. 
So meningioma generally seen as benign. There are some grade two and grade three. We don't have to get in too much fine print, but generally they're benign. And one of two things happens. They're either completely incidental, and you may well get MRI reports back saying, oh, incidental meningioma. Or they're symptomatic, which means they're pushing on something. They're pushing on the surface of the brain, they're pushing on a nerve, or they're causing some edema in the brain, or occasionally they may cause a seizure. So they're either doing nothing, or they're doing something. And that usually determines whether we do something about it, because they are usually benign. Treatment options, again, we can binarize it. We can either leave it alone, it's quite a good option, especially if it's incidental, if it's small. Usually we then just simply recommend interval imaging. At age 95, we may not need too much interval imaging, but in younger patients, we usually regularly scan. And the intervals are sometimes arbitrary, sometimes we have a sort of protocol of follow-up, but every one, two, maybe three years. We would then think about resection if it's growing or if it's pushing on the brain or a nerve and causing deficit. So if it's pushing on, if it's getting larger, and let's say it's pushing on the occipital cortex and it's causing visual compromise, well, then we think about doing something, which is usually for meningiomas surgery. Um, and the surgical risk is related to the location. That's why we get so pedantic about labeling them, cerebellar pontine angle, uh, you know, uh, uh, petroclival meningioma, cavernous sinus meningioma, uh, as an example. And then for some, like for example, the cavernous sinus meningioma, there is a role for radiotherapy. Um, if the surgical risk isn't ideal, in other words, if there's too much chance of mor morbidity. Radiotherapy usually causes growth arrest. It doesn't necessarily shrink it. So that's meningiomas, generally benign, maybe incidental. If it's incidental, we often leave it, scan every few years, every year or two. Um, but if they're pushing on something, let's think about taking it out. That's meningiomas. And that's pretty much all there is to know about meningiomas. Everything else is all about the techniques we like to, you know, discuss always in conferences. You know, if you go to meningioma conference, it's all about how do you take it out? Anything new with the biology. Gliomas, the take home message would be, well, the high grade ones, which are unfortunately the more common ones, are usually not good news. Glioblastoma would be a grade four example. Um, they're aggressive and usually they present with neurologic deficit, especially progressive over several weeks. So if somebody has progressive deficit, of course, the beautiful thing in general practice is you have the luxury of, you don't have the luxury of time in terms of seeing the patient, you're so busy, you might have five minutes, but that you have the luxury of follow-up. So you can always see someone and you can always check which direction are things heading into. And if it, anything, if there is a neurological symptom, sign or deficit and it's progressive, then what, it's, it's worthwhile having that in the back of your mind. For gliomas, in a sense, the conclusion would be not so good news, what can we do? Either nothing, if it's all too too serious or too bad. Surgery, usually for tumor debulking, to get rid of the mass effect, it confirms the histological diagnosis, that then tells us the grade and then what to plan for in the future. And usually there's a role for radiotherapy and also chemotherapy. Typically chemotherapy may be a tablet form actually, so it's not so much intravenous chemotherapy. That would be sort of a summary and an overview. I hope that helps. I'm, I hope it's not too simple. I mean, I'm sure you've seen many patients like this, but it's nice to just stand back and think about how binarized these two tumors are. Does that help so far? Yeah, that's great. All right. Well, look, in terms of the first presentation, it's uh, how they present uh, is entirely related to where the tumor is. Um, we'll talk a little bit about after surgery and what next for the patient, which depends entirely on the pathology. But if you think of it simply, a lump in the head can cause pressure, so raised ICP. Now that might be mild, so it may give a headache. Now that doesn't mean obviously that every headache is a tumor, but a headache can be a feature of a tumor. And if it's severe pressure, it may cause reduced conscious state. So hopefully that's not gonna happen in your clinic, but if somebody is drowsy, maybe drifting into a coma, then it's worthwhile obviously calling an ambulance. You would probably do that anyway. In terms of specific symptoms, it depends on the tumor is going to push on some part of the brain. It relates all about which part of the brain. So pushing on the occipital lobe, maybe visual cortex, well, visual field compromise. Uh, pushing on Broca's area, speech, maybe to expressive dysphagia. Uh, pushing on the optic nerve, well, you know, visual compromise. Um, uh, I, well, I could go on about basically any structure in the brain, but or pushing on, you know, the motor cortex, maybe or around the motor pathways, maybe uh, paresis or paralysis or weakness of the contralateral side. So one could go on about any structure in the brain, but basically, if it's being impinged upon by a tumor, that can be a symptom. So in other words, the, simple, the simplistic message would be any neurological symptom can be a feature of a tumor. So we ought to think about what's a rapid kind of screening 
neurological exam. Uh, I guess you know there's obviously proper neurological examination. One can can take an hour, hour and a half if we um, uh, you know uh, put our minds to it and do every single aspect of the neurological exam. But you, know, you don't have the time. The obvious things, you know, normal GCS. Of course, most people I would assume coming into your clinic would have a normal GCS. Although it's probably quite straightforward to tell if they're confused. Cranial nerves, a quick check of the, of the main ones, visual obviously, um, facial. But most of that you will be able to see. Uh, then the limbs, so the peripheral nerve exam, and gait. I'll break it down a little bit more. Um, in terms of the brain, if we're thinking brain tumor, it's about global overview. One needn't necessarily check every myotome. That's something for the spine, which we can talk about later on. One needn't be too pedantic about the reflexes. Of course, I wouldn't want to go on record saying one doesn't have to do all these components of a neuro exam. Of course, one ought to think about it, but should I illustrate it like this? If somebody simply has the only finding is an upgoing planter and everything else is normal, you know, one doesn't necessarily do a surgery for the reason of an upgoing planter. One has to put it all together uh, in terms of whether they have other symptoms to go with those more signs. Um, light touch sensation. I mean, of course, you can do pinprick, light touch, and everything if you have the time, or maybe rebook the patient to do all of that. But usually it's uh, reasonably obvious because the patient may actually tell you, oh, I can I have some numbness here, and then you can confirm what kind of numbness and where it is. And the main thing is basically gait. And I think GPs are very good at being efficient. You know, you'll see the patient um, walk into your office. You can tell probably quite quickly whether their gait's normal. So I guess officially I should say, yes, it's nice to do um, an entire neurological examination, but in practice, it's, it's, it, it's to get an overview of, uh, is there any major deficit? Um, and then I guess you, you have the benefit of follow-up. You can always test something more the week later or the week later. There is a possibility for any kind of tumor actually to irritate the brain in a sense and uh, to cause seizure, but unlikely in, into your clinic. I don't know how many um, of you have had people present with a seizure in a post state. I would assume most patients actually call the ambulance and go to hospital rather than go to your clinic unless you work in an after hours acute clinic. Um, of course, it's a matter of treating the seizure in the acute phase, but if somebody has a seizure and no known sort of epileptic history or no other cause, it's worthwhile thinking about a scan. And in the emergency department, that's what they'll certainly do. So what will happen next? Usually a scan. You can start with a CT. I know, I know some uh, 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 some practices you can order CTs. You might, might be able to order an MRI, but we would certainly start with ordering an MRI. And then if they have a meningioma diagnosis, so let's say they come to you, they've had a meningioma scan. We haven't quite seen them yet, or I haven't seen them yet, and they have the report with them saying it's a meningioma. Uh, well, if they're fine, if the patient's fine, it might be that we do nothing. And you know, you're welcome to obviously prepare them for that discussion or something, which is usually surgery. And then for glioma, if they have that in their report, well, we can do nothing, but it's not so much a surveillance scenario, but rather best supportive care. Or we can think about doing some surgery, primarily for diagnosis, for debulking, and for the after surgery treatments. Patients may certainly present to you after surgery. In other words, they've had their surgery, they now have to undertake their adjuvant therapy, their chemo, their radiotherapy. And usually, they come with a certain dose of steroids. And there's no right or wrong in terms of how to taper them. It is usually worthwhile tapering steroids down to off because obviously steroids have side effects. The reason why people are on steroids is usually for swelling, for edema around, either from the tumor or post-operative or during or after radiotherapy. But if they're not on any of those things anymore, chances are they don't need to be on long-term steroids at all. Um, and if you're not quite sure, oh, you know, is there a reason for this patient remaining on two milligram once a day or something, it's worthwhile checking in because chances are somebody may have simply forgotten to stop it. And it's a matter of tapering off, usually after a week. Patient will, uh, your patients will have questions like, what's next? Um, they'll ask us that, but they may also ask you, and it depends entirely on the pathology. And again, the, the binarized version would be a meningioma, generally better news than a glioma. Chemotherapy, radiotherapy, uh, and yes, you know, in, at, the, at Auckland University, we're doing, it's actually, come to think of it, it looks a bit, a little bit like coronavirus, doesn't it? But it's actually a tumor sphere. We're actually growing at, uh, um, a glio glioblastoma cell. So this is um, a, a research uh, laboratory I'm involved with at Auckland University at the Center for Brain Research, and we're actually growing GBMs, which look beautiful in terms of the picture. They're obviously a nasty tumor. It's probably a bit like coronavirus. It might, might be a nice picture, but it's a nasty virus. Um, all right. And if the next thing with a regards to a meningioma, your patients come to you, it would be usually about, if there has been a resection, it would be about surveillance. So I would usually keep most patients on surveillance, mainly regarding the possibility of recurrence. 
uh, and occasionally we uh, apply radiotherapy. One last part of this discussion, I think it is worthwhile dis uh, discussing brain metastases because they simply are more and more and more common now. So if you have patients, and oh, look, in general practice, I'm sure you have many patients who have either had cancer in the past, undertaken cancer therapy now, and certainly there's always a percentage of patients that will develop cancer uh, over this next year. The overarching question, can it go to the brain? The answer is yes. Any kind of cancer can travel to the brain. And the question then is, is whatever they're receiving now, the current therapy, is it effective for what's inside the brain because of this blood-brain barrier that's in the way? So the provocative phrase would be, if my patient has cancer and they now have a headache, ought, ought I be, um, be concerned? And I think it's worthwhile uh, that being even more in the forefront of your mind that if a patient has a history of cancer and they have a headache that doesn't want to go away, that is progressive and or a neurologic deficit, I think it's worthwhile thinking, you know, could there be something else going on? Could there be a brain metastasis or a spine metastasis for that matter, uh, if they have any objectives? So there are beautifully provocative articles like breast cancer brain metastases, the last frontier, all these articles about brain metastases being a great frontier in terms of oncology, simply because a lot of drug therapy that is highly effective for this cancer doesn't get through the blood brain barrier, doesn't get to the brain. So brain metastases are becoming more and more of a problem, but a treatable problem. So I'll certainly see more in my career, and I think we all will, in the sense that oncology is getting better and better and better. People are surviving longer and longer, which means there is time for um, cancer to travel to the brain. So we call it extracranial disease control. So there's better control, but there's a blood-brain barrier. So brain metastases therefore become a problem. There's longer survival. There's more time for brain metastases uh, to, to develop become a problem. The blood-brain barrier doesn't allow chemo to come through or many chemo agents, therefore brain metastases may become a problem. And also many chemotherapy trials exclude patients with brain metastases. They often do a screening CT or, or MRI. And in, in that sense also brain metastases are a problem. So on many fronts, metastatic um, uh, cancer to the brain is actually a problem for all concern, obviously for the patient, but also for just in terms of what to do next, what other chemo, do we have chemo that crosses? Why can't my patient be enrolled in this trial, et cetera? So then there are things uh, that we can do. Yes, lots of new research and treatments, but it's basically uh, a discussion of uh, what can we do for an isolated lesion or if there's two or three or if there's many. Even if there are many lesions, potentially something can still be done. So in terms of what you can do, uh, obviously it's worthwhile starting steroids, usually if, if the patient's symptomatic. Four milligram twice a day. Uh, four milligram three times a day. Uh, you probably have a good feel for which steroids to use. Uh, the neurosurgical knee-jerk uh, reaction steroid would be dexamethasone. So for a solitary lesion, just one metastasis to the brain, the recommendation is usually surgery followed by radiotherapy. That would be, and there would be good evidence, there's good evidence for that. So that would be the usual recommendation for a patient. Um, and one talks about the phrase locally curative. Obviously curative is never a good word to use, but basically one can take care of that lesion. If there are multiple lesions, maybe two or three, one can still take them all out. But if there are many and there's one symptomatic one, so let's say there are five or six lesions, they're all small, but there's one big one that's just pushing on, let's say, uh, the motor cortex and the patient has a contralateral weakness, then it may still be worthwhile treating the symptomatic one and following each of the others with radiotherapy. And there's ongoing research as to which chemo agents may uh, get to the blood, uh, past the blood-brain barrier. We're doing actually research at um, at, uh, at the Centre for Brain Research here at, uh, at Auckland University with regards to trying to recreate a blood-brain barrier and trying to get medication across. Uh, so obviously it's exciting in the, in the field of research, but from a practical point of view, that's the reason for all these limitations and that's the reason, uh, reason for this phenomenon of uh, brain cancer metastasis. A quick slide to show which cancers, but basically any primary cancer can metastasize to the brain. Uh, many of you, in, the, in, in terms of just chatting, I mean, uh, with uh, colleague uh, general practitioners, uh, asked about uh, things like driving. There are obviously the land and transport rules. Usually, after a craniotomy, at six months for a supratentorial craniotomy, not for an infratentorial one, and we'll usually specify that. And if people have had a seizure, it's usually twelve months post seizure free. That's for regular driving, personal driving. For industrial machinery and commercial driving, usually it's a loss of license. And there are also now um, separate sections for brain cancer, in other words, metastatic brain uh, um, uh, disease, as well as uh, for glio uh, glioblastoma, in other words, aggressive uh, primary brain cancers as well. But certainly after a craniotomy in six months.
I'm not sure whether that actually is a common question, but I've certainly heard it a few times. I thought I'll put this slide in. Yeah, no, that's good. A few questions have come in around driving. And actually, there's one thing, if I might just ask you there, um, Patrick, which is around, um, are there any driving restrictions for incidental asymptomatic meningiomas? No, there are not. Unless the patient's had a seizure, there is no driving restrictions that I'm aware of or that we gen in generally discuss or are aware of, no. And the risk of seizure for those people is considered to be low enough? Very low, yeah. Okay. Thank you, that's perfect. I think I've only got two or three slides left, actually. We can just quickly discuss cancer in the spine. Um, and it's a similar discussion. My, cancer, my patient has cancer or they've had cancer in the past, even if it's five or 10 years ago, and now they've got terrible back pain or terrible nerve, in other words, ridiculous distribution pain, or they aren't walking well. Could they have spinal cord compression? Uh, should I be worried? Again, any cancer can go to the spine, some more commonly than others. There isn't any, in a sense, uh, the equivalent of the blood-brain barrier. There isn't a blood-spine barrier. So it's probably even more readily available for cancer to go to the spine, but it can produce the worst scenario, which we see, would see would be cord compression, but otherwise nerve-related pain from radicular or nerve root compression, or just pain. And in other words, back pain or neck pain, depending on which vertebra it's situated in. And there are some things that can be done in terms of treatment, in other words, trying to treat the cancer, and also then pain management. And I think this is just, a, in a sense, a summary slide. So obviously there are many exceptions. Uh, the pain, radiotherapy is often quite effective. If there's spinal instability, usually some sort of st spinal stabilization, often ideally a minimally invasive or percutaneous stabilization. If people have a prior developing neurologic deficit, cord compression, nerve root compression, then usually some kind of decompression operation. And we're trying to save the nerve or the spinal cord in this scenario. We may not be at all curative about the tumor, but it allows us hopefully to preserve the neurology to keep the patient from uh, developing progressive paralysis and or stabilization. Uh, I was asked to keep it reasonably short. So those are the slides about brain tumors. I hope it wasn't too simplistic, um, but hopefully it's, um, you know, in a sense beneficial as to for some as for some handy tips on how to deal with things and also just uh, to take the complexity out of brain tumors because there's basically gliomas, meningiomas and brain cancer metastases as a common entity with a thousand different other things underneath, you know, as an uncommon entity. That's a great way to, to present it, Patrick, and actually a, a good way to sort of have a, a ladder to think about when you're looking at it. Um, I have a few questions. Uh, one has come in about intrathecal therapy. Yes and how that is used, and is it used in the outpatient setting? Yeah, um, intrathecal uh, therapy for cancer, uh, either yeah. primary, or also for uh, metastatic cancer to the brain, uh, can be quite effective, especially if something that doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. It's more in the realms of research and trials, so I've certainly put in intrathecal reservoirs. So it would be basically putting something into the CSF space. You can get there either via lumbar puncture, or typically what's done is we put a reservoir into the brain, so an intrathecal reservoir, uh, intraventricular reservoir. So I don't know whether you can actually see me on the screen, but at the front of the head, we, uh, there's usually a small hole. We put in the reservoir and that can be accessed through the skin. And so obviously it's an operation, but then after that, yes, it is in an outpatient setting where people get injected with chemotherapy agents uh, intrathecally, those that are allowed to be injected intrathecally. That's usually done by an oncologist. And then we can also take out CSF to look at tumor markers. Uh, certainly in the realms of fine print, we wouldn't do that too many times a year. Um, and also a lot of that is in trial stages. So um, there are trials of certain uh, ways of applying intrathecal new therapies. But the main reason to do it is the blood-brain barrier. So the better um, option in, uh, in a sense when, you know, as science advances would be to not have to need it and in a sense to have uh, regular chemotherapy that crosses the blood-brain barrier. Sorry, that's a long, uh, uh, comprehensive answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. And there's a question here about the option of cementoplasty. Is there an option yes. of cementoplasty in Auckland? And when would you recommend yes. it? Yes. So there are terms like vertebroplasty, kyphoplasty, cementoplasty, stentoplasty. They all mean similar things, which is basically um, uh, injecting something into the vertebral bones. Uh, which have had tumor invade into them. So it's an art, I guess it's a, it's a type of vertebral augmentation, sometimes it's called. So what we're describing is there is a tumor that's gone to the vertebra, uh, bone, to the vertebra, and either there's a pathological fracture or it's simply causing pain. One of the ways to deal with it is to either 
you know, percutaneously put a probe down and radio frequency uh, ablate that or, or do radiotherapy for it. But if there's a pathological fracture, one way to treat it rather than major surgery would be to inject cement, hence cementoplasty or vertebroplasty. One can try to um, uh, restore the kyphos that's formed, kyphoplasty, that's uh, inserting a, a balloon, blowing up the balloon, then inserting some cement or a type of stent. So whatever the ingredient that one is injecting and trying to restore some of that vertebral height or fracture, that's the reason for all these different words. Yet it's very applicable, it's very effective for treating pain, and yes, it's available. So um, uh, it, it can be done. Um, Patrick, someone's asked if you could please go back to the slide that shows um, metastases to the brain. And this one? A, uh, Yes, you just went past it. Oh, I went past it, okay. The summary slide, uh, I think it's from the neurosurgical text. Yeah, that one. And I think um, there's a question around, could you explain why the blood-brain barrier doesn't inhibit tumor metastatic spread? Oh yeah, that would be quite a long discussion. Um, I wouldn't be able to, um, the blood-brain barrier in the sense is broken down by, uh, 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 so if one has a, a metastasis, by definition, I guess a component of the blood-brain barrier has broken down because there's been metastatic seeding into that part of the brain. Uh, that's a very simplistic way of answering it. So yeah, the blood-brain barrier does not have a, a normal integrity there. That doesn't necessarily mean that uh, chemotherapy can follow it through that defective integrity and go and treat that cancer. Would that sort of answer the question as in, yes, yeah. a brain cancer can get there. The brain is not immune from cancer because of the blood-brain barrier, but rather the blood-brain brain, barrier can be breached and then the tumor is immune from the chemotherapy that is supposed to reach it beyond the blood brain barrier. Yeah. Yeah. It's a selective barrier. Yeah. Yeah. And I've got heap because we're doing research on it. So I can have a whole research presentation on the blood brain barrier. Obviously you don't want to hear that now and probably <laughs> never, but it, it is complex. Beautifully complex in the sense that it's a great challenge to try and get it across, but um, or to try and get stuff across the blood brain barrier, but uh, we're doing research on it. Fantastic. Um, Patrick, what percentage of referrals to you from GPs considering a patient has a tumour actually turn out to be tumours? Uh, yeah, well, most um, uh, most referrals with a tumour, they would already have had a scan through whichever route. Maybe the GP has been able to organise a scan, a patient has gotten a scan themselves, or they've come into ED, they've been discharged with a tumour, and then they're basically saying, where to next, if there hasn't been quite a, a, a follow-up plan made. So most people who get referred already have had a scan. Let's say, um, so if somebody's got a brain tumor on a scan, you're most welcome to refer because it's obviously worth addressing at least a component of it. Even if it's an incidental meningioma, it might be simply, here's the information. Hopefully we'll never need to do anything. Let's do a scan in a year or two. Um, if you have a patient who simply has neurological symptoms, um, uh, I guess the phrase would be, it would be nice if you could scan them. And if you can't, uh, can, can, can we arrange a scan? Of course one can. So I'd be happy to. You can refer either to the neurosurgery department or I suppose you could refer to uh, the emergency department. I must say, I, I wouldn't want to sort of say refer everyone with a neurological symptom to neurosurgery because um, they, may, they, may, they may not have something on the scan. Um, I don't know what the process is and the pathway for you to be able to order scans. So, um, is there, is there a pathway for you to say, the patient has neurological symptoms, can you please, can you refer directly to radiology in public or private? Is there such a thing? Because that would be, that would be the way to rule it in or out. Um, I think it's dependent on the area and on the practice okay. and the, on the practitioner. Um, okay. But generally, generally as a rule, I'd say most people know, um, there is a very common um, presentation and there are a few questions around um, patients coming in with an ongoing headache, persisting headaches, no yeah. obvious cause, no obvious neurology, um, and they are asking directly for an MRI or for a referral for an MRI. Um, do you have any uh, thoughts well, that's around a hard one. <laughs> that's, that's a hard one to address, I guess. If they have a headache and it's progressive in terms of, well, it's there, it may be getting worse over time, and let's say they develop neurology, well then it's easier because then you say, well look, there's developing neurological deficit, let's do a, do a scan. If the scenario you mentioned, they've got progressive headache and they don't have neurological deficit, and I'm assuming that's a high number of patients and probably a minority of those would actually have any kind of lesion in the brain, 
uh, it sounds like you're portraying an entity of patient that basically is presenting, demanding a scan, saying, look, I just want to know I don't have a tumor. I just want to know there's nothing else going on in the brain. Um, I mean, the simplest answer would be to say, sure, get a scan. It depends on, the, I guess, the ease of getting a scan in the sense that one could always rule something in or out. So a scan would at least give you the answer, even if it shows nothing. However, for example, if I counsel patients with regards to incidental aneurysm uh, scan, you know, oh, uh, well, sorry, if they would like a scan for looking for an aneurysm if they've had a family history of aneurysm, it's this kind of discussion, which is one has to be prepared to find something on the scan. So you might find another incidental finding. Let's say, for example, you do a brain scan, an MRI, you might find an incidental aneurysm, and they may not have known. That might then make, create more anxiety. It might cr uh, create more uh, uh, problems or consequences that they didn't know about, let's say, with, for example, getting life insurance, et cetera, et cetera. So, any, anytime one does this, uh, undertakes a scan, one has to be prepared that there could be a finding on it, whether it be related to the symptoms or not. So should I say it like this? I think if there is a concern or the patient's really demanding, it's not wrong to get a scan, but then it's a matter of if there's something on it, it ought to be discussed. I'm not sure that's really that helpful because I guess what you want to know is should you scan? I would have, you know, I think I'm at one, I'm at one extreme because I see the positive scan. So I'd say, yeah, sure, scan, because, you know, I, I do see when there's a finding. Yeah, that's right. That's I think you have a group, haven't you? Should, should I, yeah, should I sum it up like this? I have a low threshold to scan. Yeah. Um, I, I would personally have a low threshold to scan, but I'm very skewed in my um, uh, uh, selection of patients where most people have something. There's a specific that's question here around new onset of migraine over the age of 30. Is that a uh, indication for a scan in, in itself? Um, with regards to the possibility of a brain tumor, I wouldn't have necessarily thought so. As for the migraine, I'm not sure if there are neurology sort of guidelines or protocols for that. I'm sorry, I wouldn't be able to answer that well. Um, but if it's a new onset of headache, well, let me ask you, um, are there any migraine protocols or guidelines out there for these scans? Because I'm not aware of any. Health pathways have a number of them. Okay. Um, there's a question around a patient who has had a meningioma removed, has gone mm -hmm. on to have psychotic episodes mild but recurrent uh, and unless they remain on risperidone so they remain controlled from their psychotic episodes on risperidone are the two likely to be connected that you're aware um possibly uh, never say never when it comes to the brain it depends where the meningioma is or where it was let's say it's been resected um so whilst it was there could it have caused some of these symptoms maybe uh, if it's gone could it still be causing some of these symptoms possibly could it be a version of a seizure um, or could it be the side effect of the medication? Or could it be, for example, dexamethasone steroid psychosis? All of those are sort of in the differential. Um, sometimes things can be completely unrelated, though. Uh, there are reports about the temporal lobe, for example, being able to cause panic attacks. Uh, maybe psychosis, we're not sure. Hallucinations, sometimes they're versions of seizures. That would be the fine print, and it's fascinating to study. I was uh, part of a publication with, this is more than 10 years ago, we uh, discussed. Uh, um, a brain tumor is presenting with panic attacks um, uh, regarding the temporal lobe. So there are parts of the brain, I guess, that could be uh, affected in an unusual way. So the fine print or the answer would be it's possible, but it depends on where this tumor was. Um, so I can't give you an answer as to that, that particular patient for you. Sorry. Uh, and there's a further there's question. There's a high chance I'm related, sorry. <laughs> no, I think, I think that's really, yeah, that's clear. And as you say, it's, it's difficult without knowing the details around that patient. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you get patients who have had a referral through to you due to abnormal audiometry? Uh, yes, uh, if they've had something on the brain scan. Um, so abnormal audiometry and hearing loss, and if they have a brain scan, the typical tumor to discuss there would be an acoustic neuroma or a vestibular schwannoma. So it, I think it's quite typical for EMT um, uh, specialists to order a scan if there is a sensory neural hearing loss. And that is to exclude or include one of these tumors. And yes, so if there is a tumor um, uh, in that location, that would usually be reviewed by an ENT surgeon and or a neurosurgeon or both often. Thank you. Um, what would you consider as a threshold for referring to neurology uh, for trigeminal neuralgia? Is it the number of bouts, the duration of bouts, or a certain level of medication management that you've got to before? referral for um, surgery? I, I guess um, 
uh, whenever you're struggling, whenever you and the patient uh, together as a team are struggling. So if the number of bouts are basically frequent and uncontrolled, then obviously it's a matter of, well, what else can we do? And if you've maxed out what you have available, which is carbamazepine or gabapentin, it's a worthwhile thinking about referral. Uh, I would actually think about it even sooner and say, look, if you're pretty certain of the diagnosis, let's say, for example, somebody's had uh, classic trigeminal neuralgia, you've given carbamazepine and it's worked. It's worthwhile a very elective referral saying, well, look, you know, this patient has it. Um, they may never need surgery, but it may be worth a discussion. That's uh, how I often think about it. Uh, you don't have to do that right away, but that's sort of a, a very low threshold to refer. If they've had many episodes or they're simply sick of the episodes or they can't tolerate the side effects or anything else that you as a team basically, mm, it's, we're struggling now, it's worthwhile a discussion of what else is there. And it might be that there's a, you know, a major blood vessel there which is pushing on the nerve and we ought to think about something. Or it might be that they simply haven't tried another medication or they haven't tried a high enough dose of, dose of carbamazepine. Okay. I, I personally would uh, I have a reasonably low threshold um, to think about referring to trigeminal neuralgia. Similarly, it sounds like there is um, lots of indication. Yeah, yeah. And primarily to, you know, to give options. Yeah. Okay, moving back to brain metastasis. We have it. Are you all right with us asking all these questions, Patrick? There's, there's yeah, absolutely. I, I enjoy the interaction. I'm sorry that I can't, if I'm, if I'm trying to look at the screen, um, <laughs> uh, uh, but I'm sorry I can't see you, obviously, but yes. Uh, so we now have a question back to brain metastases. Can you tell us about which medications you use if people with brain metastases, metastases have hard to control seizures? Um, I, I, if they're still on, if they're on high dose levetiracetam and still get seizures. Yeah, um, we we try a number of different things. Uh, so high dose uh, levetiracetam. Uh, if they've maxed that out, one can add lamotrigine, uh, depending on sometimes the patient or the type of seizures, or phenytoin, or something like um, uh, epilim, or even the the, the the carbamazepine. In which order, I would probably go for phenytoin next. Um, and I wouldn't want to sort of give generic advice, not knowing the particular scenario with that patient. But um, phenytoin would be one option. It's a very traditional option. Um, uh, Lamotrigine is also a good option, one that has to slowly up titrate it. And if we're struggling, or if I'm struggling, uh, I would ask my colleagues, the um, uh, neurologists, epilepsy neurologists. I do some epilepsy surgery, so I often see them uh, regularly, uh, the epilepsy neurologists. Um, so if I were to have a Difficult scenario, I'd be more than happy to ask. And I think, I don't know what the health pathways sort of mentioned, but it's, it's probably, is it quite straightforward to get simply um, virtual clinic or uh, phone advice regarding anti epileptics where you don't expect the patient to be seen? Is that really yeah, straightforward? You can get phone and written advice, um, okay. which is really incredibly useful. Yeah, I mean, strictly speaking, neurologists would be the best at this, um, but I can let you know that, yeah, lamotrigine is an option and phenytoin, epilim, tegritol. I think about, I hope I haven't forgotten any of the major others. <laughs> um, there was a case that um, has come in around a woman who's on high dose gabapentin and a decent dose of amitriptyline and now getting side effects for, for her trigeminal neuralgia and is now getting side effects from this. Um, and she's wondering whether she can start to reduce her doses of her medication over time if her symptoms are under control. How commonly do you see people being able to wean off the medications once they have got that neuralgia under control? Yeah, hard to know, depending if it's neuralgia or neuropathic pain. But the sentiment to reduce it, I think, is a good one. If, you're, if your pain is controlled on a certain level of medication, and let's say the side effects aren't that great, or even if you simply want to try reducing it, it's certainly worthwhile reducing it slowly to see if there's underlying pain or if the side effects or if the quality of life is simply improved. So I guess one always wants the pain medication that gives you maximum control for minimum side effects. So if you've overshot, for example, and you've got great pain control, it's worthwhile reducing. So yes, I would. Um, how many patients uh, would then be fine in the future? Again, I see more of the patients that don't remain fine. Um, so that would probably be a similar question to how many people have it spontaneously resolved, which I can't really accurately answer. Um, but I guess the simple uh, way to approach it would be that if it's if it's fine and it doesn't recur, uh, brilliant. And if it does recur, you know what to do next. You can restart it, re increase it, or think about, well, do they want to explore something else? It's not likely to cause harm to re reduce it down. It's not going to come back worse. No, I haven't found that. I haven't found that. 
Look, Patrick, I think we should wrap it up there. We've answered almost everything that has come through and it's been a fantastic presentation. So thank you. Oh, thank thank you. you for your enthusiasm and all the, the key bits of information that have come through. We really appreciate it. Oh, no, thank you very much for having me. And I think there are hopefully some more in the future. Thanks again, Patrick. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much.